After a successful college football career, our next guest was one of the most sought-after quarterbacks entering the NFL, but his career as a football player would be short-lived as he began, his life began to spiral out of control. He struggled with drug addiction, uh, which ultimately landed him in prison for nearly three years. And here to share his inspiring story of how he turned his life around, please welcome Ryan Leaf. All right, so uh, you played, uh, you were like, it was number, it was Peyton Manning and then you were number two, right? Yeah, it yeah. was, uh, if anybody knows who Peyton Manning is, <laughs> yeah. um, it was uh, between us. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's, 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 it's funny to look back on it now, right. but. Because you grew up, your whole life was football. So you played for four years, right? I, well, I grew up in Montana. I played football my whole life. I want to be a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. um, young men, young women from Montana don't make it to the professional levels mm -hmm. um, that often. And I be always believed that uh, because I was a great football player, that made me better than you. Mm -hmm. And th that's not the case at all. You know, we're all flawed human beings, just tried to be a better person on a daily basis. And I, I, I didn't figure that out for a long, long time. Right. Well, I think that's, uh, that happens, as you know now, that happens to a lot of people. They go straight from high school to college football to pro. So you played for four years professionally, and then, then you went back to Montana. I did. I, I didn't know who I was. I, the identity was I was this football player, A, and now I was this failed football player, B, and I couldn't rationalize that or justify that in any way. So I've been introduced to Vicodin while playing because of all of my orthopedic surgeries, and... I used it to mask those physical pains, and now I was taking them to mask the emotional ones of not being able to live up to those expectations, the depression, all the things that come with mental illness, and I just started medicating. How and much were you taking a day? Well, I had to figure out a way to get 100 milligrams somehow, whether that was 10 pills or at some point 20 to, to do it, and just to be normal. And how were you getting the pills? I ended up going to doctors at first, of course, but ultimately, I didn't know a drug dealer. I wasn't a good criminal or anything. I went into people's homes, friends I knew. Uh, I went to open houses in Montana, pretending to be interested in buying the home, and would go through medicine cabinets or cabinets in the kitchen. And the shame of it was terrible, but once they were in my hand, that obsession dissipated. Yeah. This effect that opiates have on a, on, on a person's brain, it, it disappeared, and, and the ends justified the means. And how long were you living that way? I, you know, I, I started taking pills at 28, and I probably, until my arrest at 35, it wow. was off and on for seven years. And you got arrested for what reason? I got arrested for having um, Vicodin without a prescription in, okay. in my golf bag and charged with burglary in my hometown where I was supposed to be a hero. A hero. So the reason you're here, that we heard about you, is that you were watching me, you were watching this show... In your, in your cell? Yeah, so I'd had a 13-inch television at the end of my bed, and I'd watch you. And you lived this public life and had a platform of service on a daily basis, and it made me feel something. I felt like a human being again. It gave me my humanity back. It really did. It, a, an hour a day when I didn't have it, I went and found it because I saw your face. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, um, that is so touching to me that I, you know, I mean, I feel like I am so lucky that I come here and there's so much joy in this room and I get to get this from, but to, to know that I'm touching people, to know that I'm reaching people in that way, I hear it in different ways when people are in the hospital or sick, but it's, uh, it means a lot to me that I was able to, in a place like that, to, to be in prison and that I, I could reach you. So then you started, you were in prison, you started then uh, teaching other inmates how to elevate themselves. Yeah, my roommate would come in and he'd see me be either bawling or laughing uncontrollably watching your show. And one day he came in and he said, let's go down to the library. You're going to help these guys who don't know how to read, learn how to read. And it was the first time I was ever of service to anybody but myself my whole life. And it feels good, right? It feels really good. All right, so we started a foundation. So tell everybody about the foundation you started. Well, I started a foundation called the Focus Intensity Foundation, uh, focusintensity.org. What I do is I raise money for scholarships for people who can't afford treatment or mental health treatment. When I got out of prison, I couldn't afford to go to treatment. And if the NFL didn't have grants available to me, I wouldn't have been able to get the help I needed. And I don't ever want somebody who really wants help and wants to change their life 
not be able to do it because they can't afford it. Yeah. Um, you're you're a, a, a great guy, and you're an example of, of why we need to uh, to have programs in prison to actually help people get better and, and put programs in there that will um, make people have humanity again, like you said. Shutterfly cares about supporting organizations like Focus Intensity, so they want to give you a check for $10,000.